Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar for today for the Crop Modeling Community of Practice webinar. Um, a huge welcome to everyone. I see people are joining in from various parts of the world, um, and we are so, so excited to have you here with us today. Um, before we get started, I just want to make sure you all can see us and hear us OK. So if you can see us and hear us OK, please do type in the chat um, that you can see us and hear us OK so that we know that everything is working out well. Awesome. OK, I'm getting a few people say that they can see us and hear us OK. So that's a good sign. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. So yeah, we're just going to dive in. I have a, a lot of um, speakers here today, and we're excited to hear more about what's going to be the topic for today. Matthew, I'm going to turn it over to you to do a brief introduction and um, set the ball rolling. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Matthew Reynolds. Uh, I'm wheat physiologist at CIMIT and leader of the community of practice on crop modeling for the big data platform. Um, so I think that uh, let's just get started with, with Meda Devare. Uh, she is a senior research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute. And just to say a little bit about her background, she led the CGR system open access, open data initi initiative and currently leads efforts to organize data and enable semantic interoperability across the 15 centers of the CGIRR. And this is to de for development focused um, uh, through big data, the, the big data platform rather. Med is an agronomist with significant experience in microbial ecology and bioinformatics. And she also led in Nepal, the cropping systems initiative for South Asia, addressing sustainable in intensification of farming systems in Western Nepal before she moved to the CDR system office. She also has expertise in data, man data management and semantic web tools and uh, was instrumental in developing Vivo, a semantic web application for representing academic scholarship at Cornell University. So Meda um, will now talk about the portal Guardian and so I'll pass it over to you Meda. Great, thanks Matthew. Um, Hi everyone, I'm going to share my screen uh, and, and get going on this. Uh, I guess during the, the presentation, if you have questions, just type them in the chat um, or hold them and uh, hopefully we'll have questions uh, at the end. So I'm gonna try and share my screen now and hopefully you'll be able to see. Ooh, that does not look very promising. Hopefully you can see this, okay, good. Great. So what I'm going to be talking about is uh, sort of one of the flagships of the big data platform for agriculture. Uh, it's called Guardian, uh, which is the Global Agricultural Research Data Innovation and Acceleration Network. It's a real mouthful. Um, I'm just going to jump right in and, and start talking about it. But before I, I do that, I just wanted to frame the, 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 the seminar, the webinar a little bit. Uh, to let you know what this big data platform is trying to do. Um, and very broadly speaking, what, what the, the, the platform is trying to do is to harness the capabilities of, of data to enhance the impact that, uh, uh, the, that our research uh, has across CGIR, as well as more broadly speaking, across uh, the, 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 the entire domain to the extent possible. Um, how are we doing that? Well, we have three pillars that are part of the platform. The first one's called Organize, and that's the one I lead. Uh, so that's the one that I'll be focusing on. But there are two others um, called Convene, and inspire, and and the the names of the of the platform modules, these three modules, are pretty self-explanatory. So the convene one is about convening the right set of partnerships um, to to be able to deliver on 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 the promise of data and and big data in particular, um, and the capabilities. And inspire is a sort of a small grants program uh, to to make good on on you know, to pull together the whole the whole environment, really, to be able to uh, connect uh, the, the sort of the, the research environment, the research for ag environment, research for development environment with uh, application developers uh, and others in the private sector and NGO space. Um, but turning back to organize, what are we trying to do? 
we're trying to support uh, good practices in, in data management, essentially, very broadly speaking. And we're focusing not just on data management or the management of data in general, but trying to achieve findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. So that's fair data. Um, this is a relatively new concept. Before this, people used to talk about open data, uh, but, but we want to sort of, uh, make sure that we, we we get beyond the just talking about open and and diving into more into what what open really means what are the nuances there and so so these these four principles um of fair are are pretty uh useful in this area and the idea is to create a, a, a data pool that consists of data that's that's well annotated, well described, uses the right standards, uh, that will ult ultimately enable uh, easy or easier aggregation, combining across uh, data streams and data disciplines where relevant, um, and enable easier analysis as well. Ideally, some plug and play capacity there as well. Um, a key piece of that to leverage the data, to leverage this data that's supposedly being managed well, um, is Guardian. And Guardian, I've, I've put the, 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 the URL there, it's guardian.bigdata.cgr.org. Um, the landing page looks like what I'm showing on the screen here. I'm not going to do a live demo because it always goes awry when I have short amounts of time. I've learned the hard way. Um, so you'll see a set of uh, screens, basically. But feel free to go play with it and give us any feedback that, that you have. Um, right now, what, what we're doing is, is uh, uh, think of this as the Google for right now CGIR data, although we are already pointing to data and publications from other domains as well. There's some coming from uh, the PubMed Center uh, repository, there's some coming from the European Nucleotide Archive, and there's some coming from the UK Aid Publications Archive. Uh, that's all sort of hidden behind development right now. It's not in this uh, 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 production space, but it'll get into production very quickly now. Um, across CGIR, we have about 30 repositories, about 15 of them for publications, about 15 for data sets. And so what you're seeing there, these numbers, uh, uh, 96,000 publications and 2,800 plus data sets are from across all of CGIR's 15 centers. So just to give you an example, I can type in keywords into the search box, something like nutrition and gender, and I chose those two because they are so cross-cutting. Um, you could do any kind of search. You could do a search for potato. You could do a search for, uh, you know, drought tolerant maize or drought and maize, um, whatever you feel feel relevant to to your interest. Uh, and then when you when you hit the return on that, what you'll see is a bunch of search results. In this case, I'm seeing uh, something like 3,700 some publications and about 18 data sets from across CGIR. Um, and you, this is looking at the data sets now, uh, and you see a bunch of data coming from across different centers, INI, which is the Water Management Institute, the International Water Management Institute, the International Food Policy Research Institute, um, IITA, ICRAF, and then further down uh, in the, in the uh, down the list there from other centers, including Seattle and SIP. Uh, if I click on any one of these data sets, what I see here, oops, all of a sudden my, there, um, I, I can click on any one of these data sets, and this is showing you the top of the, of the data set. Um, and, and what you see is first, first and foremost, Ideally, you would see machine readable licenses. We're encouraging people to use the CC the, um, uh, licenses. And so that's what you're seeing here. Um, you'll see the title of the data set, you'll see the authors, and this is linked right now so that I can click on any one of those author names and I'll, I'll see any other uh, data sets or publications that, that they've they, they're responsible for that they're authors on in Guardian. Um, Guardian is a metadata index. It's its own. It's not actually holding uh, these resources itself. It's just pointing to, the, to them where they sit. So therefore, there's a link, the DOI, which takes you to the data um, in this case itself or the publication uh, where relevant. If I go further down in that uh, in that screen, what you start seeing is uh, a, a bit of a summary. If there's a geographic element to this to this data or to the publication I'm looking at, I will see it uh, reflected in that in that uh, map view there. Um, there's a keyword uh, sort of box, and those keywords come from uh, controlled vocabularies and ontologies at this point. And, and, and they're a way of sort of 
if I click on households, for example, what, I'm, what I'll be doing by doing that is doing a search in Guardian on that particular term from that controlled vocabulary or ontology. Um, so it's a, it's a way of sort of um, reminding people or, 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 you know, having that light bulb moment of, oh, yeah, actually, I, I'm interested in that. Um, and I don't have to sort of retype it. I just click on it and I get a whole new set of um, results, search results related to that. Um, on the, on the, in the left panel on fair compliance, what you see is a sense of, okay, how fair is this particular resource? And, and, and fair is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable again. So we've, we've got a set of algorithms that runs uh, behind the scenes, slightly modified from the, the force 11 principles. I mean, these principles for FAIR are, are pretty um, widely uh, used and widely accepted now. So, so this, is, this is what that what, what the data set is trying to, this is what the FAIR compliance is trying to point out. Uh, how FAIR is this, is this resource? Um, and it's just a sort of a, an indicator. There's nothing, you know, you're not going to be penalized if you're if if some of these numbers are not quite as good as others. It's a way of of trying to guide centers and data providers to, to okay, so I'm lagging a little bit behind, perhaps on the interoperability. What can I do to to improve that? Um, just just a way of trying to see where we are with that. If I go further down in this. Uh, data set. I'm still in that particular data set. I see the, the link to the data set files themselves and for, for completely open data sets or completely open publications, I should be able to just click on that and, and get straight to the data set. For those that aren't, I would have to go to the link, um, the DOI link that I showed you earlier in the first screen, and I would be taken to the center repository uh, and, and to get that. Um, I also see relevant publications here, and this is a, an attempt to use algorithms uh, uh, behind the scenes to, to use to look through the enriched metadata that Guardian is producing for these resources and say, okay, I see a whole bunch of publications that are related that, or that may be related to this particular data set. That it's not completely infallible, but we're trying to get there because at this point, with CGIR repositories, for the most part, uh, resources are not interlinked. So, so publications aren't interlinked, are not linked to the data sets um, that they're built off of. Um, this is a way to try and broaden the picture and give people a sort of a more holistic view of, of the resource that they're looking at. I want to show you a little bit of, of the geospatial view, which is relatively new. Um, this is looking at crop production statistics, uh, uh, the global sets of crop production statistics. Right now, we've enabled this for uh, 2005 global production data from a number of different statistical uh, sources uh, for crop production. I'm looking here at rice. Um, and I'm looking at rain fed, that's what I've chosen. I mean, you, can, you can go to geospatial view when you do a search for a commodity base. Um, when I do a search for nutrition and gender, you won't see anything in the geospatial view. But if you, if you do a search for um, something related to one of the crops, then you, you'll see that you can go uh, down to, to this um, and, and click on, on one of these parameters that you may be interested in uh, and get a global view of what the statistics say about this. Now, this is only available for 2005 right now. We'll soon be getting 2010 and 2015 data into this. I can, what's neat about this is that I can drop a pin on a country here, India, um, and it pops up a box and gives me some summary statistics for that particular parameter, for rain fed yield of rice um, for that country. I can also zoom in and using the polygon, uh, I don't know, if, oops, I guess I can't use my pointer, uh, but to the right hand side of the screen there, you see a little pentagon um, box above the pin. And I can use that to draw a polygon on an area of interest and it'll pop up the same sort of summary statistics. In this case for uh, an area of sort of slightly lower yields um, and I can do the same thing to compare an area of high yields just to sort of play a little bit and figure out what, what the data looks like. Um, we, we want to broaden, broaden this kind of functionality uh, beyond what we're seeing now. That's on the table for this year. Um, so you'll be able to see much more with the, hopefully with the data that's already in Guardian. You'll also notice you see the, a bunch of green spots on this, and those are actually accessions coming from the gene banks. So rice accessions 
uh, points of collection for these accessions uh, coming from the gene bank uh, platform. So we're already enabling some amount of data pulling from that platform, being able to visualize it here uh, from the Genesis uh, uh, platform that that or the Genesis data, database that the gene banks platform uh, at CGIR maintains. So that's that's sort of the mapping visualization data discovery piece of, of Guardian. What we're also enabling, and this is very much in, in uh, development right now, you will not find this in Guardian, but we're trying to, to getting at the at the at that interoperability piece. We're encouraging people to use control vocabularies and semantics, so control vocabularies and ontologies to describe their data, not only at the at the repository level, but also within the data sets where possible. And this is not an easy thing to do for historical data. We, we were a little over optimistic about the fact that, you know, it could be done. Uh, we're finding out that that's a very, very big ask. And, and, and what, what, what we're trying to do while developing tools to be able to annotate data sets after the fact is to um, get value out of, the, out of the data pool that we're generating that's now semantically enabled. Semantically enabled meaning that it has these semantic standards, ontologies and controlled vocabularies, to actually describe variables, data variables within your data set. So this is um, uh, diving into this tool. You would put in your, your keywords, in this case, maze, a start date and end date for data sets that I'm interested in, a location, in this case, I'm interested in Africa, in particular uh, countries in Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, Malawi, Mo Mozambique, I could put particular locations if I wanted. So it's a way of sort of, of keying in on what is, it, what is it I'm looking for in this leftmost panel entitled filter data sets. Once I do that, what I see is a bunch of data resources from Guardian. It's telling me, okay, you've got, I see you've got these, these two or three data sets uh, that maybe match your search criteria. So I can, I found those data sets. What I can then do is, is add those data sets before, you know, you see there were zero data sets chosen, but once I click on the add buttons, those data sets, those two data sets um, are chosen and I can actually view what's in those data sets without actually diving into the data set. So, you know, this is allowing me to do is, is because those data sets are well annotated, they have, they're annotated using semantic standards. I can see things like the slope percentage, textural class, maize residue production, legume cultivar, whatever's within that, in, in that data, it's telling me, okay, you have 2,044 plots that, that have this parameter slope percentage associated with, with, with it. Um, the textural class for the soil is available in 916 plots. Etc. If I wanted to choose all of this, I'm working with 2,570 plots. So it's really diving into the data itself without my having to monkey with these vast, large data sets for these five countries, which is pretty cool. Um, further down the road, what I can also do is say, okay, um, some parameters are actually less common across these data sets. Um, but I can see, you know, I can see uh, fertilizer, um, as, uh, CN, DAP, and urea, um, and tillage parameters, conservation ag and conventional ag, for instance. Um, I can remove one of these parameters. So I'm not interested in DAP as a fertilizer. I can click on that, it removes it. And so it's telling me that I'm filtering out 144 plots out of the 535 plots with these this, these fertilizers for for these for Africa for with these start mandates um, and the, with an intercrop of either pigeon pea or soybean, um, so you see uh, what I'm doing is really diving into that data without actually diving into it. So within within you know a, a, a few minutes or an hour, given a semantically enabled data pool, I can identify data sets for analysis very 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 quickly which is very cool because then what that does is it allows you to do this kind of thing and this is work that we've been doing with the university of uh, california davis uh, this is camila bonilla and uh, and and uh, a whole bunch of others who use guardian they've they've found 130 data sets in guardian to try and understand variation and crop response to fertilizer in sub-saharan africa and what they've done is just sort of gone through and thrown that uh, the data of, of four fertilizer response. So this is yield plotted against nitrogen, kilograms of hectare per nitrogen. And you see huge variation in that, in the in the response, of course, as you might expect. And when you start, then you can take that and and, and what they've done is, is map that very quickly. Uh, um, and, and, the, and the mapping is at a fairly fuzzy high level, but what you can see here is um, this is just for 
50 kilograms uh, per hectare of nitrogen. So they've said, okay, what what is what does the crop response in uh, sub-Saharan Africa look like for this this you know part of Africa uh, for at 50 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen? And that's really really cool that you can do that. Um, they spent some time finding those data sets, cleaning them, processing them, and enabling this kind of visualization. Um, but with the semantic uh, query, this kind of thing that I showed you before, getting to this point will be much faster. And then, you know, this is an R-based analysis. You can see that, in fact, for Madagascar, you can see pretty good uh, response to 50 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen. Um, whereas across, and, and it's pretty decent across eastern, um, uh, the eastern uh, part of, of southern Africa here. Uh, but then it, it, it's pretty low at the, at the, at the you know, for the, for the rest of Africa. So that's kind of one use case for what you can do with, with semantic data or with, with the data that you can find in Guardian. Uh, building that analytical pipeline from that data. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about is work that we're doing with the Agricultural Model Intercomparison and Improvement Project, AGMIP, based at the University of Florida. Um, and so this is a use case where they would like to use Guardian to find data and make it model ready and ideally get it towards more of that plug and play so that you're finding the data, you're able to put it into models and get something useful out of it. So this is a scenario where Ava um, is, is, is looking for data. Uh, she finds 37 uh, experiments for Western Africa for maize, sorghum, millet, groundnut, and cassava, five crops. Um, she then, she, you know, she's looking at that data, and ideally that, that data includes definitions. In this case, it does, because uh, the University of Florida has actually mapped their ECASA variables, which are used to describe modeling uh, data sets, to the agronomy ontology and crop ontology. So, so this data is already uh, semanticized, essentially. They're, they've done it manually by semanticizing it. Um, and then once that data is described in standard ways, all 37 of these data sets, uh, AGMIP translation tools can then take that data, translate it uh, for pretty quick dumping in, if you will, uh, to models like DSAT. So what they then did is to, to use these data sets to calibrate uh, uh, parameters, in this case, crop growth and development parameters for DSAT, for the DSAT model. Um, and then what they also found was they, they found five data sets uh, 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 which, which didn't conform, which were, could not be made model ready, but they, could, they found they could use these socioeconomic data, they were farm survey data, um, to set up some hypothetical um, uh, long-term analyses uh, to, to say, okay, what, what, how, can, how can we develop um, effective strategies for sustainable intensification using what we know from the from the survey data. So this is really really cool. Um, being able to actually develop these model pipelines is where we're headed. So if you look at what I just talked about, um, I talked about a bunch of repositories, which are these these green boxes. Um, a bunch of databases, the maybe CGR center repositories. We're enabling data upload in Guardian, so there will be a sort of a repository behind Guardian this year. Um, I talked about Genesis already, and there are a bunch of other repositories that we're harvesting, metadata harvesting. Uh, we're building up semantic query, which is what I showed you um, with those four or five screens, to create these sorts of collections of um, responses to uh, uh, to fertilizer in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, or um, soil fertility in Africa collection of data that might be of interest to others. We're, we're enabling some amount of data exploration and mapping, as I showed you. Um, we'd like to build analytical uh, pipelines, the, the modeling part that AGMIP is doing is, is part of that. Um, and, and this cloud globus thing is new because the convene um, module has just, uh, in the last three, four months, uh, enabled a subscription to Globus, which I think the, the GEMS platform is also working with Globus to, to enable us to sort of, you know, to, to not be in the bad when we're handling, when we're doing these handlings of data or handovers of data uh, to users to, 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 to make sure that the privacy um, concerns behind that data are, are dealt with so that we're dealing with trusted um, 
trusted, uh, you know, customers essentially. Uh, that's that's Globus's role in this, and I'm sure you'll hear more about that from uh, Phil and and Kevin when they talk about it. But but this part of the pipeline is what I've already talked about a little bit. Um, we're I've talked about the semantics and enabling semantic data. So so what we're also trying to do is have tools in place, and these the, the AgroFence tool, which is the agronomy field information management system, has been built uh, to enable the digital collection of agronomic data that's already standardized. So it's already conforming to semantic standards, and that'll be released for field testing this summer. We are we also have some breeding tools that are already in use, the breeding management system, the breeding, breeding for research effort that will produce semantically enabled data. Again, all of this is going to go into repositories. Guardian can get it. So now we're building that pool of semantically enabled data that makes the semantic query easier and then you know the, the, the analytical pipelines get easier as well. We also have, I, I mentioned an upload, but we also have, we have a set of tools that are in very early prototype right now to be able to annotate data sets, to be able to easily add metadata, um, uh, and, and to be able to check for personally identifiable information. And some of these tools um, uh, will, will enable, the, 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 again, the, the you know, data sets with, with good semantics going into the repositories. So this is sort of the whole environment. I've talked about most of that, but then of course, when the data is sitting uh, in any of these platforms, ideally it would also be interfacing with search engines and with external apps um, for more uh, utility to our, our ultimate beneficiaries who are the farmers, the policymakers, the researchers themselves, of course, but, but a number of others in the, in the beneficiary sector. So this is the whole picture and the, and the sort of the vision for Guardian. It keeps changing as we evolve, but, but this is the sort of the broader picture right now. And I think with that, I'm done. This is what I wanted to say about Guardian. Um, I don't know if I can take questions now or, or we can hold them uh, for later. Uh, but thank you very much for listening. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much, Meta. Um, sure. Yes, we did have some questions come up along the way, but I think we'll hold them to towards the, the end. Um, Matthew, if we still have you, we can have you do um, a brief introduction of Philip and Kevin. Yes. Yes, no, I, I'm still here. Stop sharing my screen. Great, thanks, thanks, Meta. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions, but let's, because of time, let's keep going. So next we're gonna hear about the GEMS platform from Phil and Kevin. So Phil, his expertise is bioeconomics of technical change in agriculture, agricultural pro productivity, and economic economic impacts of R and D. He's the director of the global research strategy for the University of Minnesota at the College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resources, um, and at the Minnesota Agricultural Experiment Station. He's also the director of the International Science and Technology Practice and Policy Policy Center. He spent his career developing and analyzing data to improve innovation-driven outcomes in food and agriculture worldwide. He's a prolific writer, and um, you can check that out on his site. So, Phil, over to you. Shall I in introduce Kevin at the same time? I guess so. Mm -hmm. um, so, Kevin Silverstein, he's the he's the bioinformatician. Uh, the GEMS operations manager. His expertise bioinformatics, systems biology, comparative genomics, databases, and plant microbe interaction. So a bit of a polymath here. He's the scientific, scientific lead for the research information solutions group at Minnesota and the supercomputing institute. He's spent many decades performing large-scale bioinformatic analyses, involving cutting edge high throughput data from bacteria, fungi, plants, mammals, and also complex communities. He has performed detailed investigation of plant, plant microbe systems. Um, he's led an effort to identify mutations in clinical patients with the Fairview Hospital, and this has been expanded and still used today. 
the knowledge he's gained from that uh, handling protected patient data uh, has been brought over to this platform to protect pharma and corporate data. He's also a prolific writer, and you can look that up on his site. So over to you guys. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew, and uh, a pleasure to be here chatting with everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce the, uh, uh, if we can just uh, get this up into this mode here. Uh, introduce the GEMS platform to everyone, and then I'll hand it over to uh, uh, Kevin, and we're uh, some risk takers here, so we're going to try a live demo uh, uh, of the GEMS platform today, uh, just a little bit of it, given that the time available. So uh, what is the GEMS platform? Uh, we, we set out not to build a repository as such, although we are uh, collecting uh, uh, lots of data. Uh, what we focused on is trying to develop a platform to uh, enhance uh, data-driven innovation in agriculture. And for us, that uh, uh, got us to focus on two key aspects. How can we uh, facilitate uh, data sharing uh, and how can we facilitate uh, uh, data analytic capabilities uh, that go beyond just sharing data, but also uh, uh, enable data uh, analytics. We were, we're looking across the whole uh, innovation value chain in food and agriculture. So we're looking all the way from uh, uh, experimental plots, uh, or in fact, even, even, I guess you could say, from molecules to markets. So we're going from uh, genomic data uh, on the one hand, all the way through to, to market data on the other. And that required us to, to get a laser-like focus on how can we actually make what are often uh, disparate and isolated data domains uh, functionally interoperable. So GEMS uh, stands for Genomic Environment Management and Socioeconomic Data. And so we're putting a, a lot of effort into the X's uh, between the, the G, the E, the M and the S. And then, and as Kevin will show you, how can we actually uh, make this data function interoperable to facilitate uh, analytics? We realise that in agriculture, a key dimensionality of agriculture is uh, time and space. And so the GEMS platform uh, enables us to handle data where we're uh, uh, very granular data in time and space. So we're uh, the analytic support for the Genomes to Fields project uh, here in the US, which is a 23 state uh, collective effort in corn breeding. Uh, they are envirotyping their experimental plots uh, every 30 minutes or so. Um, and so we've got very small spatial and temporal scale data there. Uh, and we scale up to uh, pixelated or landscape scale data that might have a, a time step of a week or a month or a year. And so having the data be functionally interoperable across these data domains, but also across time and space is a, is a key focus of this platform. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we're very uh, interested in uh, uh, smart modes of sharing data. Uh, as Meta talked to, there are, there are open data or fair standards out there we were well aware that there was a lot of data that had um, various sorts of uh, 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 formal intellectual property associated with it or data privacy aspects associated with it with respect to be for pharma data, for example, and things of that nature. Um, and so we wanted to uh, uh, not dictate how that data was shared, but develop a platform that enables the data provider uh, to control not only which files are shared, uh, but what uh, elements within those files are shared uh, with whom and when. So you can, uh, you have lots of flexibility. We have nothing to do with the, with the sharing. We've set that we actually make a marketplace for data sharing, if you will. So we can go uh, all the way from open data on the one hand to uh, entirely private data on the other hand. Uh, or the, the area we're very interested in is pooled data uh, where we are encouraging and incentivizing the, the sharing of data that otherwise would be left locked up on someone's computer or within an institution or a company or things of that nature. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned, we're, we're trying to look at turning data into actual information. So as Kevin will describe to you uh, today, we uh, not only enabling the sharing of data, but the platform also uh, hosts tools and workflows that links data to, uh, to tools. Uh, so we can also develop standards for uh, not just reusable data, but replicable uh, um, data. 
uh, and, and replicable, anal replicable analyses. Uh, so the gem share uh, component of the platform is focused on this, this uh, the mechanisms for uh, lowering the costs and the transaction costs of accessing and sharing and discovering data. Uh, and then we have a, a, another component to the platform called GEMS Tools, uh, which is this ever-expanding suite of analytical tools. And we recognised uh, early on, it wasn't an initial desire of ours, but uh, as Meta touched on, there's, there's lots of issues with respect to, to metadata uh, uh, in terms of incompleteness and, uh, uh, and missing metadata that we need to sort of develop tools to try and uh, improve. But we also found lots of problems with the, the so-called data itself. There's lots of numbers out there masquerading as data. Uh, and so we've spent a lot of effort and a lot of resources uh, developing a suite of tools to clean up uh, not just messy metadata, but uh, also messy data uh, that involve things like computing missing data, uh, uh, enabling this data interoperability such that you can then within the platform uh, pass the data off to advanced analytical methods associated with the G by E by M uh, component. So with that brief introduction, I'm going to, to turn uh, control over to Kevin, uh, who's going to step you through a live demo of the GEMS platform. Thanks, Phil. And so in the next 12 minutes, I'll give you a quick run through through some of the basic features. Um, just a heads up that uh, we are actually going to have a new release uh, at the end of next month. Um, so at that point, the whole interface is going to look totally different. Apologies for that. This is our existing interface. Uh, we had a great UX uh, user experience, a user interface and, uh, expert walk through uh, with, with several people and get and also a, a, um, a graphic designer. Uh, and so later, uh, it'll look very different, but we'll walk you through what we've got at the moment here. So I'm going to uh, first, uh, the, the important thing about GEMS is um, when you log in, uh, we didn't want to be in the business of holding passwords. So as Meta mentioned, uh, we use Globus actually to one, authenticate uh, users uh, so um, to verify that they are who they say they are, as well as actually to transfer data at high volumes. Uh, pretty much anyone who belongs to the network uh, of institutions, so academic institutions, would automatically be uh, uh, on here through CI login. Uh, but also, actually, the CG is now bought in to uh, Globus as a, a license, and so th uh, that will help you transfer from one, eight, one center to another center data. Uh, I can look up institutions. We have a number of partners, uh, actually. So, for example, uh, Stellenbosch uh, University is there. Uh, a whole lot of other folks uh, of our partners uh, just automatically as part of the network. Um, likewise, uh, I'll just enter Minnesota. Um, when I log in, it's very familiar to me. I don't have to remember another password. I actually just use the password, and this is exactly the interface that my university provides me. I'm going to have to be quiet for a moment <laughs> for me to remember my password. Long. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, that didn't help. Um, ah. Oh, long passwords. And uh, our particular university has two factor authentication, so this is going to push to my phone. Uh, so, super secure. Um, and but it's the way that our university connects. You would connect through your own uh, organization, however they have organized uh, connection. So now that I'm in, it says I'm logged in as myself, Kevin Silverstein. Uh, there's a bunch of things I could peruse uh, users that I would have uh, knowledge of. Not every user is gonna appear to me, only those for which I belong to uh, groups uh, with, uh, let me make this just a little bit larger. Um, there's a whole bunch of folks here that I can see, their email address, the teams. So there are various teams that you can check. For example, this IAA demo uh, would give me information about the teams that I belong to. Uh, we have a variety of levels of different, uh, of different permissions. Uh, it's, you know, on our help page, there's uh, information about what those are, but people can only, in some cases, only view, and other people have uh, a lot of access uh, privileges of things that they may do or, or not do on this platform. Uh, so that's very important, as Phil said, about the privacy and, and issues there. I want to uh, focus a little bit now on um, the issue of, suppose I have a file on my system. I just transferred it over through Globus, and I actually want to, uh, to actually 
clean up that file and then register it to be shared with others on the platform. So if I go to the share uh, section here, um, then I will basically you know, get a little browser onto the various uh, files or folders on my folder. And here's one that has data that I actually uh, added some data to. Um, I will take one of these files, for example, this experiment uh, file that actually has some data from Simit. Uh, it gives me a quick browser or, or view image there. Let me just make this just a little bit larger. Uh, and uh, it detects that this is a tab limited file. I mean, I could maybe disagree with that and say it's comma separated, but then that's clearly not the case. I can return it to, to tab delimited. Uh, it tells me that there's 21 columns in this file and also uh, assumes that the first one is a header. Uh, I could invalidate that assumption, but actually, no, as you can tell, those really are headers. So I will go ahead and uh, move over to the column data. So when I go to this uh, option, this next step towards registration, what it's going to do is it's scanning every line in that file to try to get an idea of, for each of those 21 columns, uh, what is the data type, what is the range of the values within there, uh, any particular uh, information that it can actually glean uh, from that. And you see, sure enough, experiment ID it has determined is an integer. Uh, and in fact, the low value throughout the entire file is 527. The highest value is 21,069. The nice thing about um, text values is that it will actually rotate through a few different entries so that you can get an idea for what's in there. Uh, I could add notes if I desired uh, within here saying that, uh, you know, experiment, experiment uh, IDs must be higher than 300 or something. You know, I could make a note Everything that I enter and all this information will be actually carried along as a JSON file for metadata that will be accumulated and, and annotate all sorts of rich information about every column in that file. And that's going to be carried along in addition to uh, the metadata that already exists for that uh, particular file. So likewise, when we move on to the next step, it's going to try to match to ontologies. Um, Meta made reference to uh, various ontologies as well as uh, vocabulary sets. Uh, for regularized vocabulary sets. And indeed, we actually uh, currently have eight ontologies and two vocabulary sets in this platform. Uh, ICASA is one of the vocabulary sets as well as Agrivoc. Uh, and when we're matching up, um, it will automatically split up the header names uh, into separate words and then match them to ontologies uh, through something called Elasticsearch, which matches both semantically as well as uh, as well as um, some mis mis potential misspellings. And you can see it, it matched up a few of the terms, but here's one location ID that it didn't match up. So we can actually go in there uh, since we're annotating our file and say, oh, I think that's good enough to be location. Uh, name of series, it couldn't find. I can look for one there and say, oh, series name, that's very close to uh, more or less what I had meant to match up to and so on. And you can keep on doing that annotating. We try to make the annotation of your uh, file with metadata is as seamless and easy as possible. And the best person to actually annotate it is the person who actually generated the data, who hopefully is the one uploading this data. So we move on from there. Uh, we can actually clean up uh, entries in our file, for example, spelling errors, et cetera. If we go to each column and see if there are any potential spelling errors that are detected, we find indeed for Simit's headquarter, lowland tropical, lowercase, there are 17 entries, whereas capital L, capital T, Lowland Tropical, there's 4,090 entries. So sure enough, that's probably the correct uh, spelling. Same thing with Zimbabwe and Kenya. There's lots of different alternative versions of Simic, Kenya, et cetera. So we could just say select all, but be careful to look at cases where the automatic semantic matchings didn't quite work. For example, uh, pathology matching to physiology is something I should not uh, select. Same thing with entomology going to physiology. So then I could save the changes. I could then, uh, once I've gone through all the files, I can uh, save a, a version of the corrected spelling uh, within that corrected spelling version and so on. Um, let's not wait for that. I'm going to go actually move on to metadata because we have a limited number of time. I see I've got four more minutes. Um, 
here's an important part, and this is we're trying to enable folks to uh, store regular metadata about the file. Before we showed you metadata about the columns that got tacked on. Here's metadata about the file. So we give a rich set of examples. Um, so uh, this, you know, these are standardized uh, terms that are uh, that are included here. Uh, some nice examples of ways that you can enter the information. Asterisks by those that are required. Optional ones are there as well. We even have fields here that you could enter uh, for CGIR specific terms from the CGIR core. Uh, the rest of the terms up there that you saw from the Dublin core. Um, so these would be terms that would be required typically in CGIR platform. Likewise, uh, we have specific things. None of these or, uh, additional ones are actually required, but actually help uh, richly annotate the file so that when we later do searches along the metadata, Phil didn't quite mention, but we actually allow people to share metadata separately from the data itself so they can make their data discoverable. So even if you don't make your data available to others, you can tell them, I've got you know, this particular beans data from uh, Argentina and it was uh, collected during these particular years. And then people could say, hey, you've got that data. Can you share that with me? And then you could flip the switch and share the actual data. So spatial temporal, there's a lot of rich spatial temporal information. Uh, likewise, genetic information about sequencing. Oops, that was interesting. Sequencing that you can uh, apply environmental terms about uh, where we have nice uh, drop downs for a particular biome or climate uh, and things of that sort. Management. Uh, various cropping systems taken directly from the agronomy ontology and things of that sort, as well as uh, socioeconomic fields. So all that would uh, enrich the metadata. All right, with a few remaining minutes, I think I'll show you one more example of uh, cleaning. Uh, and uh, that would be um, once we wanna, the thing about this, this is not a repository. This is actually uh, a, a place where you can analyze data uh, as well as uh, deposit data. And, and make it interoperable with the cleaning tools I just showed you. So we can uh, analyze data through Jupyter Notebooks, RStudio, a lot of folks are familiar with RStudio, or even just a desktop uh, background. So let's just show you briefly the, uh, the power of the Jupyter Notebook. For those who can program in R or in Python or Scala, uh, this, is a great this is a great place where you can actually do a bit of analysis. I'll show you one example uh, analysis um, I've got here. This is showing my directory. Uh, I see I already had this up. Um, sure, that's useful. Under my tools directory, and then I have a geodata cleaning. This is a module uh, created by our collaborator from McAllister University, Gatira Ansango and his team. Um, I'll clear the outputs. So the thing about uh, Jupyter Notebooks, oops, clear all outputs, there you go, um, is you can start with a notebook with just a little bit of code and this is importing this map tool. And then you can say, I want to run uh, all of the cells. And it will go through each bits of code. Each of them are start as asterisk and run through them in real time. Uh, some of these are, haven't caught up yet and are running. Um, there we go. Um, briefly, what it does is if you have geospatial data, and this is real data, again, from Simit, uh, where uh, the map tool basically maps things, we grabbed the data from all the uh, planting locations for maize in India. Uh, then we go and plot those. Um, then we go plot those. And we see immediately that although they're supposed to be uh, locations in India, some of them are in various other places of the world. So the nice thing about this tool package that we have in here is um, we can actually calculate those which are outliers, those which are not part, uh, mapping to India, for example. Uh, then, even better, we can actually apply corrections. Uh, it applies a pretty simplistic correction algorithm that actually works most of the time of looking at the uh, lat-long coordinates and, and trying to do some transpositions of the lat-long, trying to remove and add minus signs and do various combinations. And we'll then apply those corrections so that you have all the values in India where they belong. Um, I think that's enough for this particular tool. Uh, I will just go back to the analysis here. Oops, new page. Um, just a comment, you know, RStudio will land you in exactly the same set of file systems, so you can grab your data within RStudio if that's more familiar to you than the notebook. And likewise, you can have a desktop and you can run literally any uh, Java or various applications that run on a desktop um, within this environment. Again, and it has all the files that you just played with and had access to and, and shared with other people. 
So great analysis as well as uh, system, as well as actual cleaning up data and, and um, sharing. So um, with that, I think we will uh, minimize this, that. Um, woo, that's a nice little thing there that folks. And so let's see. I think we can remove the screen sharing by right here. Awesome. Thank you, Phil and Kevin. Really, really appreciate um, the insights that you shared with the, um, yeah, with the people participating currently. Um, so we actually do have questions coming in. Because of time, we might not be able to get to all the questions, but um, I would encourage participants um, to yeah, keep asking the questions. I'll make sure that we can pass it along to the speakers as well. Um, so I'm going to start with a question for Meta that came up. So it's asking about what are some of the key challenges you see having to deal, um, what are some key challenges you have to deal with as you move forward with Guardian? So Meta, that's a question that came up for you. Yeah, um, you were breaking up a little bit, City, there. So just to be aware, um, I hope everyone can hear still OK. But in terms of challenges, I think the biggest one probably is uh, figuring out that sort of that, that line between the granularity, not the granularity of the data, but the, the privacy issues, really, how we enable the kinds of analyses that, that, that we can enable uh, while still keeping the, the personally identifiable information uh, um, you know, keep making sure that we're following best practices there. Um, and so this is where we're hoping to learn a lot from what GEMS has done and perhaps to, to, to leverage some of the work that the, the, that platform is already doing in terms of, um, uh, in, you know, enabling the privacy um, guidelines best practices uh, to be also taken care of. So I would see, I would say that that's probably one of the biggest challenges we face right now. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and another question that came up was about what other services or features um, you're hoping to roll out in the near future? Yeah, so many of the services I showed you, some of you I think wanted links. Um, many of those 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 services I talked about in the, the semantic query, um, screens that I showed you are not actually in production right now. So they should be on the production site uh, sometime by the, by the summer or soon after that. Uh, that's the goal. Um, the mapping is already available. So, so, and we, and we, we were thinking about ways in, uh, to enhance that. So for instance, uh, we would like to be able to uh, show you uh, data uh, on the map, you know, on, on the, on the, on the globe, essentially uh, data sets, you know, when, once you do searches, uh, just see where those data sets are emanating from what, what location um, tags there are within those data. So that, that's something we want to work towards. Ultimately, if the if we end up with a pool of well-described semantically enabled data, then then we should be able to do much more with the mapping and data exploration as well. So that's something that's that's coming. Um, of course, those those other tools, the ontology annotation. I think it'd be good if if um, the Gems team and our team can collaborate on that more and develop something that's useful for us both, because we've gone quite a bit of the way um, down that road, and so have they. Um, so hopefully that'll happen in the future. But that's that's a tool that that we expect to have stand be, be standalone available for, for those who need it, as well as um, part of the Guardian upload um, steps. You know, we're envisioning a workflow there uh, that it'll be part of, along with the PII checker, along with the metadata entry, et cetera. So we're seeing those as standalone tools as well as part of the upload um, workflow for, for Guardian. And that's all gonna be coming pretty quickly, certainly before I would say the fall of this year, before August, September of this year. Great, that's actually a good segue to one of the questions that we had. People were asking um, what are some potential ways Guardian and Gem could cross talk because you're seeing a potential for both platforms complementing one another. So I'll let Phil and Kevin weigh in on that as well, um, ways that both platforms can cross talk or collaborate in some way. Yeah, well, the, the good news is uh, we, we started talking about that last uh, October at the Big Data Convention. And we had uh, quite a good uh, set of sit downs with uh, Meta, Brian King, and Pythagoras. And uh, we also have a document uh, going back and forth between um, Meta, Pythagoras, and us about uh, trying to think about ways. We'd, we'd like to 
Um, you know, we'd, we'd like to basically set up a, an API by which folks, if you logged into Guardian or into GEMS, could actually uh, tap data from the other platforms and, and pull in uh, information and, and work towards more uh, integration to make it easier for the, uh, for the end user, actually. I mean, the end goal is to make it as easy as possible for the end user. Great. Thanks. Well, that's, uh, we did have a number of questions coming in. So I think I'll end on how can people reach you if they have more questions? What are the best ways that people can reach you to ask any follow-up questions? Um, so first of all, I mean, um, for us, we've got a website, uh, agroinformatics.org. Uh, and, um, you know, that's, that's a great way to learn more about us um, as far as contact and things. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, e email is probably the best contact. Yeah. So uh, um, shoot us an email if you want to follow up. Okay, sounds good, Matthew. I'm going to turn it over to you for um, any comments or closer to Max that you have. You can unmute yourself and then. Well, just I just want to say a few words. That first of all, thank you for for all the speakers. These are really really a good job. It's very clear that the these are highly complementary efforts if you think about the cg it's it's a public goods um enterprise and for decades has been collecting data the I, the international weed improvement network alone has collected around 20 million data points and that data has been hard to access and now with the with the the guardian portal that changes everything and especially with some of the things that Meta was talking about, some of the principles of making the data accessible and interoperable and so on. These are key things. This is providing opportunities that have never been available for in terms of research, um, for donors to understand better their landscape, for NGOs thinking about starting new initiatives, the private sector, policy makers. These are some really significant opportunities that are being provided. Baselines for research can be shown, gaps can be can be discovered. These are opportunities not available until now. Um, and then of course you link that to GEMS with the computing power, with the ability to clean data, um, impute missing data. These are again providing more opportunities, the, the advanced analytics, the breadth in terms of disciplines. What we're seeing here, apart from the obvious synergies between these platforms, is just such an unprecedented opportunity to make use of, of the kind of data that has been collected already and, and is continued to, to being collected. And it's in, and this is in a context of a world that is facing some serious uh, threats to food security. So, I, so I, I I wanted to thank all of the speakers and everyone who participated. And of course, you can follow up with the speakers. And uh, if you're if you're interested in the community of practice on crop modeling, you can get in touch with me or Witsky as well. So thank you very much for your participation. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining in. This video will also be archived so that people can access it afterwards. Um, and we're going to put in the emails that you can use to follow up as well. So thanks, everyone, for your time. And look forward to the next webinar as well. Signing off now. <laughs>